Fine. So this is the practical session of electromagnetic fields. And in today's class, we'll discuss about the long and short transmission lines. So this is especially for you, my dear students and young researchers, and you can reach me at d.chrishwanan at the rate of gmail.com. So before beginning the session, once again, let me thank God for giving me this opportunity to deliver this useful session to share my knowledge among my fellow national, international participants, students and young researchers. So in this class, we'll discuss about how you can calculate the wavelength, what happens if the transmission line is short, then we'll discuss about the electrical shortness of cable, how you can minimize the impact of the transmission line length on a circuit. Then we try to observe the reflection coefficient and standing wave, the transmission line voltage and the current wave equations that are associated. So we'll discuss about FWT, forward traveling wave. Then we'll discuss about the input impedance and of course the reflection coefficient formula. We'll also understand the relationship between the incident and reflected waves and about the characteristics of the reflected voltage. So at regular intervals, I'll be giving you some short videos to discuss the knowledge in our topics. Fine. So how you can calculate the wavelength? So we have to express the distance traveled by the voltage or maybe current signal along the transmission line in relation to the source frequency. So maybe a AC waveform with a frequency of 60 Hertz will be having, you know, one cycle in 16.66 millisecond. So maybe at the speed of the light, like 186,000 miles per second, the will have the distance of 3,100 miles that a voltage or maybe a current signal will propagate at that time. So if the velocity factor of this transmission line is lesser than the unity, the propagation velocity will be lesser than this 186,000 miles per second and the distance is lesser by the same factor. So, but even if we try to use this uh, coaxial cable's velocity factor from the last example, we saw like 0.66. Okay, so the distance is still a very long 2046 miles. So whatever the distance we calculate for this given frequency, you can call it as a wavelength of the signal. So there is a simpler formula for calculating the wavelength. So lambda is equal to V by F. So lambda the wavelength v is nothing but the velocity of propagation and f is nothing but the frequency of the signal so this lambda the wavelength uh, the you can use it in whatever unit of length in the velocity of figure so let us take in the case uh, if it is meter per second means then the wavelength would be in the meter okay so velocity of propagation is usually the speed of light that is approximately 186000 miles per second when calculating the signal wavelength in open air or maybe in the vacuum. But definitely it will be less if the transmission line has a velocity factor of lesser than unity. Okay. So maybe if the long line is considered to be one, at least quarter the wavelength in length. So you can see why all the connecting lines in the circuit has been assumed short. So for a 60 Hertz AC power system, the power lines would have to exceed 775 miles in length before the effects of the propagation time become important. So cables connecting an audio amplifier to speakers would be over like 4.65 miles in length before the line reflections would impact a 10 kilohertz uh, audio signal. So when you try to deal with this uh, radio frequency systems, though the transmission line length is far from the normal. So let us consider a 100 megahertz radio signal. The wavelength is approximately like 9.8202 feet. So even at, at the full propagation velocity of light, that is 186,000 miles per second. So a transmission line carrying the signal would not have to be more than two and a half feet in length to be considered long enough. So with a cable velocity factor of 0 0.66, the critical length will be shrinking to 1.62 feet. So we'll understand what happens if the transmission line is short. So when the electrical source is connected to the load through the short transmission line, the load impedance is going to dominate the circuit. So when the line is short means the characteristic impedance is of very little concern with the circuit's behavior. So we see this when testing a coaxial cable with a ohmmeter, the reading it will measure. 
So the cable will be reading it as open from the center conductor to the outer conductor if the cable end is left unterminated. Okay. So though, though the line acts as a resistor for very brief period of time after the meter is connected, it is immediately will be behaving like a simple open circuit, the impedance of the lines opening. Okay. So since the combined response time of the ohm meter and of course human being greatly exceeds the round trip propagation time up and down the cable, it is electrically short for this type of application because we uh, register the terminating or maybe the load impedance. So it's a extreme speed of the propagated uh, signal that makes us unable to actually detect the cable's 50 ohm transient impedance with the ohm meter. So maybe if you use a coaxial cable to conduct a DC voltage or maybe current to the load and no component in the circuit is capable of measuring or maybe responding quickly enough to notice a reflected wave, the cable you can consider it as electrically short and its impedance is irrelevant to the circuit function. So here you see how the electrical shortness of the cable is related to the application in a DC circuit where the voltage and current values change slowly, nearly any uh, physical length of the cable would be considered as short from the standpoint of the characteristic impedance or maybe the surge impedance and the reflected waves. So taking you know the same length of the cable though and it's used to uh, using it to conduct a higher frequency AC signal would result in the different assessment of the shortness of the cable. So here when the source is connected to the load through this longer transmission line, so the line's characteristic impedance is going to dominate over the load impedance in order to determine the circuit behavior. So in other words, an electrically long line will be you know a very important principal component in the circuit. So its own characteristic will be you know overshadowing the load characteristics. Okay. So maybe with a source connected to one end of the cable and maybe we have load to the other end, the current drawn from the source is a function primarily of the line but not of the load. Okay. So it's much more true. Okay, the longer the transmission line is. Okay. So let us consider a hypothetical 50 ohm cable of infinite length. Surely the long transmission line. So no matter what kind of load we connect to the one end of the line, the source will only see 50 ohm impedance because the line's infinite length prevents the signal from ever reaching the end where the load is actually connected. Okay. Here the line impedance will be defining the circuit behavior, rendering the load completely irrelevant. Okay. So how you can minimize the impact of the transmission line length on a circuit? So the most effective way is to match the line's characteristic impedance to the load impedance. So if the load impedance is equal to line impedance, then any signal source connected to the other end of the line will see exactly the same impedance and will have exactly the same current regardless of the line length, whatever may be the line length. So here with the perfect uh, impedance matching the line length only affects the amount of time delay from the signal departure at the at the source to the signal arrival at the load. So however perfect matching of line and load impedance is not always practically possible. Okay. So we try to observe the reflection coefficient and standing wave. So various types of waves are you know quite similar. So maybe like the voice you try to uh, echo of a cliff, the electrical waves will be reflecting when they encounter a change in the impedance of the medium they are traveling in. So wave reflection can lead to a very interesting phenomena called as the standing wave. So standing waves are very important because like musical instruments are actually producing the sounds. So for example, like uh, if you take in the case of guitar, like a string instrument, that would not function without the predictability and amplification effects of the standing waves. So however, in the ARF design, the standing waves are undesirable when we aim to transfer power from one block to the other end in the signal chain. So here the standing waves can affect the performance of different RF, different microwave systems from anechoic chambers to you know uh, microwave ovens as well. So while the concepts of wave propagation and of course reflection are not terribly complicated but of course it might be confusing. So the best way to visualize how the waves propagate and of course reflect of a discontinuity is to plot the wave equations for different configurations. 
So here we see the wave equation. So we apply the source signal Vs of t is equal to Vs cosine omega t to the line. So the voltage and current waves are nothing but V of x comma t is equal to A cos omega t minus beta x plus B cosine omega t plus beta x. So similarly the current equation I of x comma t is equal to A by z naught the characteristic impedance okay uh, cosine omega t minus beta x so exactly opposite minus b by z naught cos omega t plus beta x so here this a and b nothing but the constant that can be found from the boundary conditions at the input as well as output port of the line z naught characteristic impedance beta is nothing but the phase constant so the equations correspond to the configuration where the positive x direction is chosen from the source to the load. So maybe if we represent these waves with your face as the forward traveling wave which is nothing but incident wave and maybe backward traveling wave which is nothing but reflected voltage wave will be a e power minus j beta x and b e power plus G, j beta x. So here you see the positive axis direction from the source to the load and then here from low to the source okay so here you see a e power minus j beta x b e power j beta x so this use 4c from the characteristic impedance so this is uh, x is equal to 0 x is equal to l here d equal to l d equal to 0 so from source to load and load to source so regarding the transmission line problem it's much more convenient to choose the positive axis direction from the load to the source as you see in the diagram okay so in order to find the new equations we have to replace x by l minus d so here you see the forward traveling wave a e power minus j beta x is equal to a e power minus j beta in place of this you put l minus d so here you see a e power minus j beta l then e power plus j beta d so this one you can take it as a1 e power j beta d okay so this a1 is equal to a e power minus j beta it sets a new constant okay so you can verify in the new coordinate system the reflected wave again from this one this a e power minus j beta l equal to a1 similarly will be b1 e power minus j beta d so here b1 is equal to b e power plus j beta l so here the voltage total voltage and current phases are shown in the equation 1 and 2 so v of d is equal to a1 e power plus j b d plus b1 e power minus j b d so this is the equation 1 and similarly its current equation i of d is equal to a1 divided by z dot e power plus j b d minus exactly opposite minus b1 by z dot e power minus j b d so these equations you know it's much more easier to examine the load effect on the wave reflection because the load is at d is equal to 0 that is how you try to simplify the equations so d equal to 0 the following equations are obtained at the load end so v of v at d equal to 0 would be a1 plus b1 so here this is equal to 0 so anything e power 0 that is 1 okay so this is the equation number 3 then you have the current equation i of d equal to 0 is equal to a1 by z0 minus b1 by z0 because the remaining e power 0 1 so let's consider the case where the line is terminated in the open circuit so with the output open circuit which means at zl the load impedance is equal to infinity output current would be actually 0 so from here we have a1 equal to b1 so the total voltage v at d equal to 0 would be twice of the incident 2 of a1 so for an open circuit line the reflected voltage is equal to incident voltage at the output and the total voltage at this point would be two times double that of the incident voltage. So similarly we can use equation number 3 and of course 4 in order to find the ratio of the reflected wave to the incident wave for the imaginary arbitrary load appearance ZL. So the ratio is a very important parameter because we determine the reflection coefficient that we will see here okay so we'll try to understand the input impedance and reflection coefficient formula so using the first equation and of course second equation we can find uh, the ratio of v by i voltage to current that is nothing but the input impedance of the transmission line 
at different points along the line. So here we will be seeing the fifth equation. Input impedance Z IN of D is equal to V of D divided by I of D. Voltage divided by current which is equal to Z naught A1 E power plus J beta D plus B1 E power minus J beta D. Similarly divided by <coughs> A1 E power plus J beta D minus B1 E power minus J beta D. So you see that the line impedance at the load end of the line at D equal to 0 is equal to load impedance ZL. So you see ZL is equal to Z0 A1 plus B1 divided by A1 minus B1. Okay. So here we will be having you know the ratio of the reflected voltage wave to the incident voltage wave which is nothing but B1 by A1. That is nothing but the reflection coefficient. Okay. So the reflection coefficient either you can say tau or maybe tau whatever may be. So ZL minus Z0 divided by ZL plus Z0. So that is the equation number 6. This is the reflection coefficient. So you can see out of all these for a terminated line there is a definite relationship between the incident and of course reflected waves. So you see that the reflection coefficient it's a complex number and both the magnitude and phase information of this reflection coefficient are very important. So for the power transfer we will have load impedance equal to uh, the output impedance that leads to reflection coefficient to be zero. So in this case the wave applied to the input is completely absorbed by the load and no reflection occurs. So we will consider two special cases here one a open circuit line and another one a short circuit line. So while the concepts of wave propagation and of course reflection are not basically complicated but definitely it will be confusing. So the best way to visualize how the waves propagate and of course reflect off a discontinuity is, is to plot the wave equations. So there are many online simulators especially for this purpose to have a better understanding of the wave propagation concepts. Then we have short circuit lengths. So with a short circuit the total output voltage should be zero at all the times. So here from the equation 6 what we saw we have the reflection coefficient equal to minus 1. So the incident voltage wave can be given as Vi of D comma T the input voltage equal to real part of A1 E power J beta D E power J omega T. So it is actually A1 cosine omega T plus BD okay plus beta D okay. So the, these are the example curves for the forward voltage backward voltage and total voltage for T1, T2 and T3. Okay. So this is the top, middle, backward. Forward voltage, backward voltage and total voltage. Okay. So the above curves break down where the length of the transmission line is 0 0.2 meter. The load is at D is equal to 0. So beta is equal to 50 radian per meter. So the signal frequency is 2 gigahertz. Okay. So note how the incident wave gradually moves towards the load which means at D equal to 0 as you know the time passes. So middle curve you saw the backward okay. So the reflected voltage that moves away from the load okay. So the reflected voltage equation can be given as VR the reflected voltage D comma T is equal to real part of the reflection coefficient A1 E power minus J beta D E power plus J omega T which is equal to A1 cos omega T minus beta D. So here the reflection coefficient is set to minus 1 to take the short circuit into account. So the total voltage is nothing but the sum of the incident voltage and reflected voltage that are given in the lower curve. The forward voltage fluctuates between minimum and of course maximum values at all points along the line including the lower end of the line. Okay. So the reflected voltage takes the opposite value of the incident voltage because the total voltage is always zero at the lower end. Okay. So the total voltage is going to stand still and unlike its constituent waves the total voltage wave is not traveling in either direction. So for example the maximum and of course zero voltage points do not shift with respect to time. So here we have the plot which shows the total voltage for 36 different points in the time. So here we will be having the zero crossings nodes and of course the position of the maximum volt amplitude which is nothing but the anti nodes they are the fixed positions along the line. So since the wave is not traveling in either direction you can say it's a standing wave.